good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to um, introduce a very good friend of mine, an old friend of mine um, from Argentina, Dr. Cristian Carman. He's an assistant professor of philosophy and history of science at uh, Universidad Nacional de Quilmes in Buenos Aires, Argentina, as a researcher of the National Council for um, Science and Technology Research. He's also a member of the Commission for History of Ancient Science of the International Union of uh, History and Philosophy of Science. And uh, today he will speak on a very complex ancient mechanism uh, the Antikythera mechanism, orbits, gods, and gears. Thank you very much. For it. Ignacio Silva for, for the invitation also, and um, particularly for this kind introduction to myself. And, well, he, he's also a, a great friend of mine. Um, actually, he, he did something that nobody did for me. Um, I will try to say it in English. When I was preparing my PhD thesis. Uh, I need some papers and I didn't find it in Argentina. And he told me that he will come in here to, just as a tourist to London. So I asked him to, to photocopy some of the papers on the uh, British Library. And so he spent one afternoon in, in the library for me, photocopying, but this is not all. He, he spent all his money photocopying the papers because the photocopies are very expensive at the library. And because there are still two or three pages in, in one paper, he write it on his own hands for me. So he spent many, many hours for me. Nobody did this for me. So he's a really great friend. So um, at least since Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, it is usually accepted that scientific theories are deeply influenced by ideas which come from fields external to science, like culture, religion, philosophy, and the like. Even if they come from outside of science, they could become constituents of the very core of the theory. The history of astronomy offers plenty of examples of this. The most famous one, is the Earth's centrality and immobility, coming first from Platonic and Aristotelian metaphysics, and then also held by the Catholic Church, partially for religious reasons. As it is well known, it was not until Copernicus that a consistent theory explicitly opposed to this thesis was suggested. There is, however, at least one idea which, coming from outside of science, was even more persistent than this one. It was so persistent that not even Copernicus or Galileo dared to put it into question. The circular orbits of celestial bodies. It is common to hear that ancient astronomers thought that the planetary motion must be uniform and circular because of the divine nature of celestial bodies. This historical thesis is of course well founded. In the Almagest, Ptolemy explicitly says that his purpose is to demonstrate for the five planets that all, all the apparent anomalies can be represented by uniform circular motions, since these are proper to the nature of divine beings. The particular way Ptolemy used uniform circular motions for describing the apparent planetary motion was the epicycle and different system. But we do not really know that much about the origin of the epicycle and different system, mainly because we know very little about pre-Ptolemaic astronomy. As it happened many times in history, when a great author writes a great book, and Almagest means exactly that, the great book, actually the greatest, all the previous books tend to disappear because of the lack of interest in copying them. But recent research on an astronomical mechanical device dated to the first or second century BC offers us new insights to try to discover how the epicycle and different system was proposed. This evening, I will argue that the epicycle and different system was not inspired by the nature of gods, but by a particular solution to a mechanical problem present in a mechanical device. 
I will present this in three steps. First, I will describe very briefly the epicycle and deference system. Second, I will introduce you into this particular mechanical device known as the Antikythera mechanism. Finally, I will develop the reasons that I think support the mechanical inspiration hypothesis. As it is well known, the sun moves over the stars one revolution per year. The best way to model this annual motion of the sun is postulating an orbit centered in the Earth along which the sun turns uniformly one revolution per year. But actually, the sun doesn't move uniformly during the year. At what time of the year the sun moves a little faster in the fall and at another a bit slower in spring. Introducing a smart modification to our model, we can account for that. We simply have to introduce the center of the orbit. Excuse me, you have, we simply have to move the center of the orbit, introducing thus an eccentric point. Or we can keep the orbit centered to the Earth and introduce a new small orbit centered around the other orbit and rotating at the same rate but in the opposite direction. The combination of the two motions produces the exact same motion that the eccentric, the eccentric model produces. The big orbit which carries the little one is called deferent, which in Latin means the carrier. The big one, the big orbit which carries the little one is called deferent, which in Latin means the carrier, as I said before. And the little one is called epicycle. Thus, under some circumstances, but this not finished. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, okay. The planets also have a delaying motion at their own rate, but they have a strange behavior, namely a retrograde motion. The planet seems to stop for a while, go back, stop again, and then recover the usual direction. Fortunately, if you reverse the direction of the epicycle and introduce the correct periods, you obtain the same retrograde motion that you observe in the sky. So the Greeks also used the epicycle and deference system for modeling the planetary motions. This system, therefore, proved to be very powerful. I don't know why he's starting alone. So the Greeks also used the epicycle and different system for modeling the planetary motions. This system, therefore, proved to be very powerful. Actually, It can be demonstrated that this system could reproduce any possible orbit, no matter how irregular it could be, if you are ready to add as many epicycles as needed. Here you should see an example. I don't know. Yes. It's not just so simple. So, 
Here you have an example using 10,000 epicycles. By the way, this shows that the epicycle and deference system was not an absurd theological constraint that delayed the development of science, but a spectacular and very powerful scientific tool. Of course, the Greeks could, do, could not do this because it implies something like free series, and so it is anachronistic. But the point is to highlight the power of the system. So if an orbit has a so complicated uh, motion, you can do it with epicycles and deference. <laughs> so you only need to have as many epicycles as needed. OK. So let me tell you a story about an, inter an amazing device that is changing our view of ancient astronomy. At the beginning of the 20th century, a group of Greek sponge divers led by Dimitrios Kontos, concluded their fishing seasons in North Africa and returned home. On their way back, while crossing the channel between the Kithra Island and Crete, a severe storm forced them to stop on a small island named Antikythera. After the storm, they began to dive off the coast of Antikythera, hoping to further increase their coffers. One of the divers, after having been diving to 42 meters deep, rose up clearly upset, saying he had seen human bodies at the bottom of the sea. Captain Contos immediately descended and returned minutes later holding a human arm of a bronze statue. It was the first archaeological shipwreck and so far the most important. The treasure fills several rooms today at the National Archaeological Museum of Athens. Beautiful bronze statues, weapons, furniture, but there were also rescued fragments of what appeared to be some kind of navigation device known now as the Antikythera mechanism. Here you can see the head of the philosopher of Antikythera. How do we know for sure that it is the head of a philosopher? Well, who else could, could be with this guys? <laughs> and the beautiful youth of Antikythera. The study of ceramics and other items of daily use concludes that this date in or close to 80 to 50 BC. On the other side, a sample of the wood of the ship has been dated by the carbon-14 method and it proved to be at least 100 years older than the actual shipwreck. The fragments have clearly signs of having been suffering the inhospitality of the sea for two millennia. However, you can still see clearly many gears, some fragmented scales, a pointer, and several words in Greek. Here you can see the three main fragments, the front of the main one and the back of the main fragment. Here, there you can see clearly the gears. This is the fragment B. This is the back of fragment B. Maybe you can see here some Greek letters. No? A lambda there. Here is the, the fragment C, the front of fragment C. Here you can see more clear the letters, the Greek letters, and two scales. And this is the back of the same fragment. <coughs> the style of the script of this inscription helps to date the construction of the mechanism between 100 and 150 BC, although it cannot be ruled out an error of a century before or after those limits. A century of research was needed to discover finally its structure and working. It was a sort of computer that, by moving a handle, pointed social and astronomical events on different dials. We had to wait until the 50s to begin to understand in detail the structure and function of the mechanism. Derek de Sola Price, a scholar from Yale University, was the first who, with the help of Caralambos Caracalos, obtained radiograph of the fragments to see in detail how many gears it had, how many teeth each gear had, and how they were connected with each other. Here you can see the X-rays of the main fragment and the same x-rays with the teeth superimposed. It was very hard to see the teeth 
as you can guess, and to detect the connection between the gears. Of course, it is very important to know the tooth number of each gear, because this tells us the proportion of the revolution of the gears. Therefore, we have to look at some astronomical significance of the gear revolutions. Here we have an example. This first gear of 64 tooth teeth moves this one of 38 teeth. The 38 tooth gear is connected with this 48 tooth gear, which is below it, and moves, this moves with this 24 tooth gear, which is attached to this big gear of 127 gears. This moves this of 32 teeth. So the last one moves 13.36842100 revolutions for each revolution of the first one of this of 64. This number might not tell us anything, but it is 254 over 19, meaning that the last gear revolves 254 turns when the first revolves 19 turns. And the historians of astronomy know that the moon revolves 254 turns over the zodiac in 19 years. That is, in 19 turns of the sun over the zodiac. So we can conclude that there was a pointer attached to the first gear axis and another to the last gear axis in such a way that while the first pointer would show the position of the sun in the zodiac, the second pointer would show the position of the moon. This is consistent with what, with what we know about the two concentric rings that we have in fragment C. We can read in the inner one the word helai, here at least the alpha and the iota, helai, which means libra in Greek. We suppose that this was the scale of, for the zodiac in which the sun and moon pointer showed their position. On the outer ring, we can read pahun, and to the right, paini, at least the pi and the alpha. Both are names for the month in the Egyptian calendar. We know that Greek astronomers used Egyptian calendar as it is very simple. Now, because it takes the sun to, to the sun one year to revolve around the zodiac, the same arrow could show at the same time the position of the sun in the zodiac and the day of the year. The next protagonist of our story is Michael Wright. Michael was curator of mechanical engineering at the London Science Museum. Having read Price's work, he found several errors and worked hard from the 90s until now, correcting Price's proposal and discovering new features. Wright designed and built with his own hands a tomography scanner, and for several summers, tr he traveled to Athens to work with the fragments with an Australian colleague, Alan Bromley. We can mention two very important contributions of Wright. First of all, he proposed that the mechanism should be understood as a planetarium. That is, that it shows not only the sun and the moon, but also the five known planets. There was one pointer for each planet, all concentric with those of the moon and sun, and sharing the same zodiac scale. As we mentioned before, the planets have a retrograde motion that could be represented by the epicycle and different system. <coughs> now, the planetary pointers in Wright's proposal also have a retrograde motion. And the mechanism used by him reflects, mechanically, the geometrical proposal of epicycles and difference. Indeed, he proposed a gear behaving as an epicycle over another gear that would do the difference job. It is worth noting that even if it is plausible that the mechanism showed the motion of the planets, the exact way in which it did it is conjectural, for the gears of this part didn't survive. Here you can see the planetarium of Wright in action. So you can see there are the pointers. There is one pointer with retrograde motion, and then start again the usual direction. Now, the second of Wright's proposals is related to the back of fragment C. Wright realized the purpose of this strange mechanism, this part. 
he realized that it makes rotate a little sphere at the rate of the synodic month. So the little sphere representing the moon was painted half white and half black, and it showed the moon faces. You can see this smart mechanism working here. Here is the ball representing the moon, and so it, it was showing the faces of the moon. As I said before, Price asserted that the sign pointer also shows the day of the year. But for doing that, he had a price to pay. Price had to pay a price. For, as you remember, the sun doesn't have a uniform motion during the year, while, of course, the courses of the day are uniform. This implies, in the worst case, a difference of two and a half degrees or days. So if the pointer follows the sun mean speed, it would show accurately the day of the year, but not the sun position in the zodiac. On the other hand, if the pointer follows the true motion of the sun, that is, the non-uniform motion, the pointer would show the exact position of the sun, but not the exact day. Price supposed that the arrow follows the mean position of the sun, showing correctly the day, but not the sun position. But Wright proposed another hypothesis. He suggested that there were two pointers, one following the mean motion of the sun and showing so the day accurately, and another following the true position of the sun and showing so the position of the sun accurately. He proposed an epicycle device for producing the non-uniform motion of, the, of this last arrow. But Wright was not right, even if it sounds like a contradiction. James Evans, Alan Sondrake, and I have shown that the true solution of the Antikythera keeps the best of both worlds. It has just one arrow turning at the sun mean motion, but that single arrow shows at the same time the true position of the sun and the correct day of the year. How is this possible? We have realized that the scale of the zodiac is non-uniformly divided. Here are the two pointers of right. This is the sun pointer and the day pointer. They are now a little separated to each other. So these are the, the right proposal with the two pointers. So we have realized that the zodiac scale is non-uniformly divided. In the places where the sun goes faster, the marks are closer to each other, and in the part of the zodiac in which the sun goes slower, the marks are more distant. So, even if the pointer goes at the same speed, it takes more time to travel one zodiac sign when the sun is moving slowly another way, and the other way around two. The extant part of the zodiac ring corresponds to the part of maximum speed, and we could prove that the marks are close to each other in the exact proportion to reflect the acceleration of the sun. So the red arrow corresponds to the uniform division, and the yellow lines correspond to the non-uniform division. You can see how well the, the yellow line is with the real marks. So it is clearly non-uniformly divided. Now, there are two ways of reflecting the non-uniformity of the sun. One Greek and geometrical, another one Babylonian and arithmetical. The Greek proposal is based on an eccentricity. This model implies that the sun changes his speed constantly. If the marks are based on this model, the distance between, the distance between two marks will never be the same, for the sun is constantly changing its speed. So this is the model with the eccentricity. So each mark is different to the other ones. The Babylonian method, on the other hand, is arithmetic. It postulated that the sun goes, goes at a constant speed, but has two different speeds in two parts of the zodiac. In one part, it goes faster, and in another one, it goes slower. This implies that the marks would be all equal, equally distant in the same part. 
Now, curiously, so this is the Babylonian proposal, the blue one, all the marks will be equally distant. And this is the Hipparchian, the eccentric model proposal, in which all the marks are differently, the, the distance between the marks are, di are different. <coughs> Curiously, the mechanism seems to have been inspired in the arithmetic Babylonian method and not in the Greek, which would be available at the time of the mechanism construction. And this was totally unexpected. At the beginning of the new millennium, the British filmmaker Tony Frith and the astronomer Mike Edmonds of the Cardiff University created the Antikythera Mechanism Research Group, an international and multidisciplinary team formed for deciphering the mysteries of the Antikythera Mechanism. The team got permission to work again directly with the fragments, but this time they applied two new technologies to them. Frith convinced a company specialized in building very powerful tomography scanners to build a new scanner designed to look at the Antikythera fragments. The scanner was able to take 10 images per millimeter and after uploading all the information into their software, they were able to rebuild the fragments in 3D, helping drastically new research. So here you can see a, a movie with the slices of the tomography. This is of the main fragment. This is the big gear in the surface of the main fragment. And then we are deeper and deeper watching all the other gears. You can see how well they are connected. Then there is a plate and then another set of gears. These are the 32 gears that we saw before. So it's really impressive and, of course, it's really helping the research. Second, the team used a technique known as PTM, polynomial texture mapping, developed by Tom Malzvender, Malzvender, an employee of HP, which involves taking pictures of an object with a fixed camera but with flashes at many different angles in such a way that, again, when you examine the pictures using special software, you can play with light and see even the slighter, slightest surface irregularity, helping to read the Greek characters and scale marks. The aim of Tom in developing this technique was to help showing shadows in a more realistic way in animated films. But he realized that it would be very helpful for reading ancient inscriptions. So here you can see a picture using this technology and how it is much more easy to see all the letters and the marks. And here you can see the PTM in action, how you can change the, the light focus to see all the details of, of the letters. And how you can see all the surface irregularities. Of course, you can, you can zoom each part and, and so see the slightest detail. So here you can see clearly the letters, which is really easy to work with this technology. So using these technologies, Frith team has succeeded in reconstructing much of the mechanism and made very important new discoveries. One of their discoveries is related to the way the mechanism showed the motion of the moon. Even if the moon never has a retrograde motion, the irregularities in her motion are notorious. Of course, Greek astronomers had a geometrical model reflecting this motion using an epicycle and a deferent. Now, Frith and his team discovered that they also managed to introduce the same non-uniformity in the pointer of the moon, in such a way that the pointer has the same motion that the moon would have according to the theory. This was performed by what is, a, what is perhaps the most, the most striking and surprising feature of the Antikythera mechanism, the pin and slot device for producing the lunar inequality. 
This clever device, completely unattested in ancient astronomical literature, produces a back and forth oscillation that is superimposed on a steady progress in longitude. The key point of the device is the pin of one gear that introduced in the slot of the other gear slightly of centered with respect to the first, moves the second gear at the average rate of the first one, but because of the eccentricity, the second has a non-constant motion. So, we saw previously the gear train for the 64 tooth gear to the 32 tooth gear called here E2. Price thought that the moon pointer was attached to this gear axis because this gear has the correct rate for the mean motion of the moon, as we saw before. But Frith and his team realized that E2 is connected with E5 through an inner shaft. E5 has 50 teeth, just like the other three that you can see here. So E5 moves K1, K1 moves also K2, but using the pin introduced in the slot of K2. K1, K1 has a pin that is introduced in the slot that has K2. As we said, K2 is a little of centered, which means that it doesn't have the same axis as K1. And so K2 moves at the correct mean rate, but with some oscillations. This non-uniform motion is translated to E6, again through an inner shaft to A1. E1 moves B3. And the, the moon pointer is attached to the axis of B3. Consequently, moves the moon pointer with the moon non-uniform motion. Here you can see all that I said, but probably more clearly. So all, all the, the first year train to the 32, the 32 is connected with this of 50 teeth, which moves this of 50 teeth that has the, the pin, which is introduced in the slot of, the, of this gear, which moves this one, but now with the non-uniform motion, we move this one of 32, which moves the other, and this go to the axis. Now, if you see from, from here, you can see the irregularity that this system, the pin and slot, produces in the gear. So how it's forward and backward regarding the mean motion. Frith team also managed to understand almost all the back of the mechanism. There were two big dials located vertically on the back of the mechanism together with some subsidiary rings inside of them. The upper ring was a complex lunisolar calendar, while the lower one while the lower ring was an eclipse predictor. Let me show you first the lower ring. It was divided into two 23 cells, each corresponding to a synodic month, distributed in four turns of a spiral. Most cells are empty, but in the month that an eclipse would take place, the cell indicated that the eclipse would have taken place and indicates whether it would be a solar or a lunar and the time of the eclipse. The eclipse cycles, known as Saro cycles, states that the eclipse repeats every 223 months. If a solar eclipse took place today, 223 months from now, there will take place a very similar solar eclipse. Therefore, that pointer could be used for predicting eclipses in Eternum. But the repetition is not perfect. Actually, from one cycle to another, the occurrence of eclipses moves eight hours. That's the reason for this subsidiary dial inside the Saros ring. It turns very slowly, one turn every 54 years, that is every three Saros cycles, indicating whether to add eight hours, 16 hours, or nothing to the value of the time inscribed in the cell. The upper back ring, as I mentioned, is a lunisolar calendar based on the metonic cycle. This calendar repeats every 19 years. 
I don't have time here to develop the details of this calendar, but it is important to know that because every Greek city has had its own calendar, the month names of the extant part of the dial allows us to conjecture that the mechanism was made to be used in Corinth or any of its colonies, such as Syracuse. Now, we know that Archimedes lived in Syracuse, making him an extraordinary candidate for being the maker of the mechanism. It seems that the mechanism was built at least a decade after Archimedes' death, so he probably is not the maker of this particular device, but he could have started the tradition. As we can see for the complexity of the mechanism, this is probably not the first mechanism ever made. It would be like saying that the iPhone is the first cell phone we have ever built. Its complexity, its elegance, its multitaskability tell us that it is the mature fruit of a long tradition rather than the first of it. The same can be said about the Antikythera mechanism. Is Archimedes the Steve Jobs of the Antikythera mechanism? Probably so. At least we have a clear text of Cicero where he says that Archimedes built a mechanism very similar to our mechanism. And we also know that Archimedes wrote a treatise explaining how to build this kind of mechanism even if the text didn't survive. The lunisolar calendar has two subsidiary dials inside. One revolved one revolution every 76 years, that is four metonic cycles, and indicates when they had to skip an extra day in the metonic calendar once every four cycles in order to correct it. The second, one of the most amazing, revolved one revolution every four years and was divided into four cells. In them, we can read the names of the Panhellenic games so that the arrow indicates what game would be played that year, the Olympics, the Nemea games, or other games. So in one device, we are able to know the position of the sun and moon, and probably also the planets in the zodiac. The day of the year, you have an eclipse predictor which tells you the time and kind of the eclipse. You also know if you have to add eight or 16 hours to the time indicated. You have also a very complex lunisolar calendar indicated even when you have to omit one day every 76 years for correcting the calendar. And finally, which Panhellenic games would take place this year? As you can see, it was like an iPad of ancient times. <laughs> now, this, mechaniz this mechanism helps us to understand better pre-Ptolemaic astronomy. I think, we think, it is not just my idea, but mainly James Evans' idea, that it could be indicating to a possible mechanical origin of the different and epicycle system. So now I will give some reasons for supporting this hypothesis, and this is the third and last part of this lecture. It is worth noting that this is a hypothesis that belongs to the context of discovery of scientific theories. Thus, due to its very nature, more than a strong demonstration, we aim to offer good evidence for its plausibility. On the one hand, it is always hard to argue in favor of a hypothesis related to the context of discovery, because when scientists present their theories, they typically emphasize their justification, neglecting the ways in which they arrive to their ideas. This is particularly the case in ancient mathematics and astronomy, where the axiomatic way of presentation almost always followed Euclid's elements. On the other hand, as we said before, the origin of the epicycle and different system is greatly unknown to us. Having this in mind, however, we can offer some supporting facts of the plausibility of our hypothesis. These facts could be gathered in three main topics. The date of the Antikythera mechanism the particular way in which the celestial, some celestial phenomena were mechanically reproduced in the Antikythera mechanism, and some textual evidence for supporting the influence of mechanical solutions in theoretical problems or in theoretical sciences like geometry or astronomy. I will briefly describe them. First, 
even if, as already said, we don't know almost anything about the origin of the epicycles, it is typically attributed to Apollonius of Perga, who died around 190 BC, because of some reference of Ptolemy. As well, we have some papyri of the second century BC related to epicycles. So, we could place the origin of the astronomical use of epicycle, say, at the beginning of the second century BC. On the other side, for reproducing the motion of the moon, the Antikythera mechanism used a device which have some similarities with the epicycle and different model, even if it also has important differences, as we will see soon. Frith and his team assert that the mechanism was constructed during the period 150 to 100 BC. Taking into account the uncertainty of the limits and the margin error of the method used, we could assert that the mechanical and the theoretical use of the epicycle and deferent are more or less contemporary. Nevertheless, our latest research, again with James Evans, tend to indicate an even earlier date for the mechanism, around 215 BC. I cannot describe here the details of the argument for they are tedious and complex, dealing with the nature of the calendar, the start date of the mechanism and other details. But if this is true, then the mechanism could be from an even earlier date than the known use of epicycles in theoretical astronomy. This is still an open question and the research is still in progress. I think that we should have news this year. But for now, the current date of the mechanism, given the uncertainties that we have, makes the proposal at least possible. And if we finally can show an even earlier date, it would render the hypothesis really plausible. For the mechanism could have been built even before the supposed date for the proposal of the epicycle and different system. Second. There are some details in the way in which the Antikythera mechanism represents the motion of the sun and moon that tend to show that the mechanism was not inspired by theoretical Greek astronomy. More precisely, if you look at some aspects of the mechanism in detail, particularly the selection of some parameters and the way some puzzles has been solved, it looks like the mechanism doesn't follow Greek astronomy directly. In other words, some parameters and some ways of solving problems are not the parameters and ways that you would expect to choose for an ancient Greek astronomer. In the case of the sun, as, I saw, as we saw earlier, the solution proposed in the mechanism for displaying the solar anomaly was inspired in the Babylonian solar theory and not in the geometrical Greek proposal. And as I also said before, it is totally unexpected for a mechanism made in the Greek tradition. In the case of the moon model, we have two different details. The pin and slot mechanism for producing the eccentricity and the periods represented in the gear ratios. Regarding the eccentricity, we know that the amplitude of the eccentricity used in the pin and slot mechanism is larger than that used by Hipparchus in his eccentric model, and it's closer to the value that might represent the Babylonian lunar theory. It is worth noting that the difference is so tiny that it could be due just to inaccuracies in the construction. Also, Fries and his team already noted that the period used by the moon anomaly is not the value we know Hipparchus preferred, but an attested Babylonian period, so again, when Greeks and Babylonians disagree, the mechanism chooses Babylonians. Finally, it can be, show, can be shown that the way that lunar model was translated to gears in the mechanism is not the natural way in which a Greek will do it. The natural way is to, do, is to use a big gear representing a different and a smaller gear as an epicycle rotating both at their particular rates and directions, just as Michael Wright did for the planets. When Michael invented the model for the planets, he thought like a Greek and used the geometrical model, uh, models available for the Greeks. And his model is simpler and more natural than that of the moon. 
it is hard to explain the details, but at least you can see that it is really hard to recognize the geometrical model of the epicycle and the different in the moon pin and slot device. So it seems again that the Antikythera maker has not in mind the epicycle and different system as we know it when he designed the moon device. All these details together seem to show that the mechanism tried to represent mechanically the Babylonian astronomy. And for doing so, it used a gear turning to another gear as an epicycle. Therefore, it looks as the Antikythera mechanism used epicycles without taking them from the Greek astronomy. Finally, there is little but strong evidence that Greek mathematicians used mechanical solutions for developing their own discipline. As I have pointed out, it is unusual that scientists reveal their method of discovery. Nevertheless, the beginning of the 20th century saw the discovery of a palimpsest with a lost work of Archimedes called The Method. The book consists on a letter written by Archimedes to his friend Eratosthenes, in which the great mathematician reveals to his Alexandria colleague what was his method for discovering, not for proving, many geometrical theorems. Curiously, Archimedes asserted he used mechanics for discovering geometrical theorems. Archimedes says, seeing moreover in you, as I say, an earnest student, a man of considerable eminence in philosophy and an admirer of mathematical inquiry, I thought fit to write out for you and explain in detail in the same book the peculiarity of a certain method by which it will be possible for you to get to enable you to investigate some of the problems in mathematics by means of mechanics. Moreover, there is a text of Theon of Smyrna which could also be very persuasive. For he relates an astronomical proposal, in this case the concentric spheres of Eudoxus, with gears. In mathematics useful for understanding Plato, when Theon is discussing the concentric spheres of Eudoxus, he says that one might think it natural for all the spheres to run in the same direction, but nevertheless the planets go in the contrary direction. Thus, he says, they suppose that there are certain other solid spheres which, by their own motion, make the carrying spheres turn in the opposite direction. The same, he says, as in the mechanical spheres, where wheels turning about their axis can, with the aid of teeth, make turn opposite directions adjacent bodies in contact. In summary, as I said before, our hypothesis cannot be demonstrated, but is enough, there is enough evidence to consider it as a serious historical hypothesis. I try to show, this is the conclusion, conclusion. I try to show that it is possible that the epicycle and different system could have been proposed not following the external influence of some conception of the divine, but inspired by the mechanical solution to a specific mechanical problem that is, how to represent with gears the regular periods of celestial bodies known by the Babylonians. So it is possible to argue that the epicycles and deference entered Greek astronomy, not because of natural philosophical considerations, but because some geometer applied a geometrical image of gearing to a cosmic problem. Now the epicycle and deference system was the definitive answer that ancient astronomers gave to the platonic demand of circular orbits. Thus, it is plausible to think that it was watching at gears and not at gods that astronomers came up with the circular orbits for the epicycle and different model. Of course, the opposition between these two hypotheses, god or gears, is just a, rhetoric, a rhetorical effect to keep the audience interested. Probably the more plausible solution involves both factors. Because we found that gears share the same uniform and circular motion suitable for divinities, the idea has been welcome among platonic astronomers. Probably the correct expression would be not God or gears, but God and gears, 
but not just gods. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for such a fascinating story um, and hypothesis. I'm sure there are plenty of questions, so um, I'm going to pass the microphone around and uh, just keep it going around through the questions as, as, as we say. Um, shall we start in the gentleman in the back? Yes, you. My, my question relates to the, the use of the pin and slot mechanism. Um, it, it, it seems to me that the moon is the only object which is actually circulating. Sorry, if I, if I have to it's on. Is the only is the only object circulating around the Earth, and that this means that it's, it's possible not to get to dispense with the the deferent and uh, descent cycle, and to use the pin and slot. It's precisely because it's so much simpler that you can do that. It is actually rotating around the Earth. So it's not that they chose it as as because it. it is simply because it was a simpler way of representing a, a different and epicycle model. Is, okay. that, is that possible? It, it yes, th thank you. Uh, it it's is. really a very interesting question. Um, first of all, for ancient astronomers, the moon has a very complicated motion. So f forget who is rotating about around who, or which is rotating about which. For, for Ptolemy, for example, the moon, is, the, the moon model is the most complex. Now, um, and they used epicycles and epicycle and deferent for producing the moon anomaly. Actually, Ptolemy has to add one little more epicycle for correcting the, the motion. On one hand. On the other hand, we have proved uh, a couple of days ago that we can use the pin and slot mechanism for producing, for reproducing the motion of the planets also. And so it is very possible that the Antikythera maker used the same pin and slot mechanism for the planets. We have not too strong... The problem is that the, the gear, the gear trains for the planets is missing. We have not this fragment. So it's open to speculation. And Michael Wright did a spectacular uh, work with these gears rotating over gears. But w when he proposed his model, he didn't know yet the pin and slot device, which was discovered later. So he used an epicycle and a different in, in gears. He reproduced this model. Now, we, we can prove that it is even easier to reproduce the motion of the planets using pin and slot. And we have some tiny empirical evidence for that. So it is possible that, um, just possible, that in the mechanism were also pin and slot devices for the planets. This unifies all, all the, the planets. For them, the moon and, and the other planets were not really too different. Just for us, we know that the moon is rotating around the Earth and not the planets. But for them, the difference is just that the moon didn't, the moon didn't don't actually doesn't, uh, retrograde, have retrograde motion. Okay? Can I ask a supplementary on that? Then? If, if the pin and slot could, could have been used, and so we're, we're comparing a situation in which you're saying we have the deferent and epicycle for the moon is represented using pin and slot, and all the others um, is represented also using pin and slot, you're saying? Could, yes. It could have been. It could be. could have been. But is it possible that for some of those, they actually did have supplementary gear, so they're having epicycles as well? That, yes. that, that you can only use the pin and slot to, re to, to represent one different epicycle and the rest has to be done with gear. So you can have, hy you can have hyper epicycles to, to do the fine tuning. Is yes. that possible or is it crazy? Yeah, of course it's possible. Um, and it's very interesting because if this, was the ca if this were the case, then uh, we have one model for the moon and other models for the planets. We know, uh, at least, uh, is usually accepted that the moon and the planets used in ancient times the same model, the epicycle and different. But well, this mechanism has a, a lot of surprise. So it could be, 
it could be, and it would be even more interesting that to prove that the pin and slot is used in, in each um, in each planet. Anyway, we think that we have evidence for supporting the other hypothesis. Okay. Thank you. Um, I used to be a, a mechanical engineer. In other words, I was taught to use tools and to shape metal. Mm -hmm. So my interest really is not so much why it was made or who designed it, but who made it. Because the, the skill, let it, the, the, the ability to, this is, these, these, this is made of what I would suppose is brass, is it? Mm -hmm. of bronze, yeah. Or bronze. So the, the, the simple, simply to produce flat sheets of brass, which could then be cut so accurately that they would not interfere with other sheets of brass rotating on different spindles, to actually then cut the teeth so accurately around the perimeter, these are fantastically complicated mechanical problems. I would, I would, I don't know how to do that. I do not know how to mark the gradations. The gradations are not just, as you pointed out, very wonderfully, wonderful presentation, are not, e not even. They are actually, something has to, you have to have another machine to tell you where to cut the marks on the, on the gear levers, on the gear, on the, on the, on the gear wheels. Um, my question is, is there anything similar to this? Is there any evidence at all of where these skills were developed, or are there other mechanisms which are even approach it in complexity? That's the question. Okay, yes. Um, it's, uh, as you said, it's not just interesting uh, as an astronomical device, but um, uh, as a mechanical device. He's, this is revolutioning the, the history of mechanics, because this kind of complexity, we, we can find it only in medieval times, in late medieval times. So, um, but Michael Wright, the, the curator of, of the London Museum, says that he built his own model using only um, the things that the Greek had. So he built his, uh, is it, it is possible to do it because he did it. Um, we know, we didn't know who did it um, and we really don't have any examples of this complexity of uh, machines using gears. Of course, we know that there are there were other machines with gears, but uh, the aim of this machine was to to move things, not precision. It, it wasn't computers. Uh, and the first, the, the next one that we have is from 600 BC. And it is much, much simpler than this one. And the other one is from uh, 1221, and it, and it is here in the Museum of Oxford Science Museum. History of Science. Oh, History of Science Museum. Um, so it is really, really amazing, and it's the only one that we have. I think that it, it will be start to appear on others. Because when, when you have one and you start to look at one, well, maybe there are others. We have some textual evidence, as I show a, a text of Cicero, that the historians of science tended to ignore, to say, well, Cicero is saying crazy things because it is impossible, <laughs> until you see the, the mechanism. So, um, and of course, it seems that, uh, as I said before, it, it's not the first one. You don't use a pin and slot and, and no, no. eight, nine gears just for the moon in the first mechanism. So there will be a long tradition. So we hope to find others. We know, at least from Archimedes, who wrote a treatise about this kind of mechanism, up to uh, Ptolemy, who in his planetary hypothesis uh, says that he, writes, he wrote this book for the mechanism builders so that he can understand better his model. So in Ptolemy times and in Archimedes time, there were mechanisms. So we have several centuries. We have to find others. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
uh, um, did did you say that some of the the um, the brass plates were covered in Greek letter, Greek, Greek letters? Like, they have in some, in some plates. We have Greek letters. That's right. Yes. So describing the various. Um, okay. The, the, what, what says the inscriptions? Um, in the front part of the mechanism, there is a parapegma. A parapegma is like an ancient um, star calendar, which says which stars is rising this day and which star is setting this day, because this has to do with also with atmospherical effects, with storms and uh, things like this. So you have in, in the in the zodiac ring you have key letters, A, alpha, beta, gamma, and then you read in, in some kind of list, alpha, this start is uh, setting, this start is... So th this is part of the text that we have. Then on, on the back of the mechanism, we have some... We have just words. We have not sentences. But uh, the words have to do with the, probably how to use the mechanism. So it mentions, for example, the 223 cycle, it mentions the 254 years, it mentions the moon, it mentions also the planets. That's another uh, argument for supporting the idea that in some way it shows the, the planetary motions, because at least Venus and Mercury are mentioned there. Um, and they are still working on the inscriptions, trying to translate it. So maybe there are news this year. So <clears throat> since the plates are fused together, I presume, it, it may be still possible to, um, uh, to distinguish more fragments of, of, of writings. Or, or well, <clears throat> using the, the CT, the computer tomographies, we discover a, a lot of inscriptions inside not because it was writing inside, but because the corruption and these things of two millennia in, in the water. Um, but we know that there were one plate protecting the front dial, then we have the, the plate of the front dial, one plate protecting the back dial, and the plate of the back dial. So we have at least four plates. Then there are strange letters in some strange parts that we really don't know what they mean. So there's still a lot to, to know about. Yes, of course, of course. The, the tomography, the computer tomography was, were taken at 1905. And there are a lot of material to work, a, a lot. So I think we understand the main things of the mechanism, the front dial, the back dials. But there are a lot of surprises, so who knows? It, it could be new news this year, so very interesting, yeah. Any other questions? Thank you so much for a very fascinating uh, lecture, really. Um, I, I was wondering if you could tell us um, uh, given that you studied this so in detail, who would be using this, and how common would they be? Um, kind how of around, common? And how common might they be? I mean, you said there was a plate on the front, so would presumably they transport them. I mean, there's something which was, I mean, about how big were they? Mm -hmm. I mean, we saw from the pictures and this kind of thing. But what, what could you tell us about the life of one of these types of devices? Okay, this is another very interesting and difficult to answer question. Um, we know that it was portable for those times. It was the size of a big dictionary, more or less. Um, but for what? This is a very interesting question. Probably it's not a mechanism for uh, calculating uh, with precision. I mean, using uh, your hand, you can calculate very more precise that using this mechanism. It could be used for, it could be useful for an astrologer, astrologist, astrologer, because they, they don't want to study 
astronomy, but they need it. So they can know, well, when you're born, and they, they move the handle, and, and they can know where it's the sun and the moon, and so they can predict. But one objection to this proposal is, is that the, the astrology became common later. So probably it is not for astrologists. It could be for didactical purposes, for, for uh, study and, and learning um, astronomy, maybe. Or it could be also uh, just a Greek that can show that the universe could be in a box. Oh, that you can uh, reproduce the order of the, the cosmos, the order of the universe in just one box. Or it could be also a, a luxury thing that our rich people ask and a great scientist did it. So we really didn't know yet, don't know yet. Just a follow up, I mean, is it possible it was used Jeez. for for navigation on ships? I mean, because it was found in the ocean. So maybe yes. they wanted to know, like, you know, if they were sailing at night, they wanted to know when the moon would be at a specific point in the sky and the stars and so on. Yes, this is a, a very good proposal. It, actually, it was uh, sustained at the beginning of the research in the first 30 years, more or less. I mean, from 190 to 1930 or, or a little bit more. But the problem is that it is really not useful for navigation purposes. That's uh, the followers of, of this position says that it could be a reason for supporting his proposal because the ship wrecked. So maybe <laughs> they were using the, the, the Antikythera mechanism for navigation purposes. But it, it is really much easier to do a thing much more simple simpler without all these gears, so probably not. Any other questions? Andrew? No, I would like to ask a question. Maybe if I... So maybe to add a little argument in favor of your proposal, um, you're welcome. <laughs> so, uh, it's about the dating of the mechanism um, and the devices within it. You say that it might be before the first proposal of the epicycle and different theoretical mm -hmm. proposal, but Freeth and his friends, uh, they don't agree with that. Um, and for all what they've done, they seem to be like a leading guys in this. So maybe you can say that this particular mechanism, the Antikythera box, mm -hmm. was built later when they say so. However, the device was invented before the epicycle and different. And uh, the tradition of makers, because you say it's a long tradition of makers, right? The tradition uh, of makers just kept on using the old system and didn't adapt mm -hmm. to the new uh, epicycle and different, even though it was common when this one in particular was made. Yes, I, I see the point. Like a prehistoric remain of... Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yes. It is a very nice ad hoc solution to the problem. <laughs> <laughs> we... Um, it could be, it, okay. but... <laughs> It seems that the pin and slot mechanism uh, is the, the new feature of, the, of this mechanism. I mean, you can say that uh, the others, the, the previous mechanism has, for example, the, the gears for the motion of the moon, of the mean motion of the moon, or the gears for the motion of the sun, but this seems like the spectacular new feature of this mechanism. Why? Because it's spectacular, just for that. <laughs> now, we have we have to to study much more this right. this thing. Anyway, we Fritz and his team is not. Uh, they don't disagree with us in this. They they would like also to have uh, Archimedes, the the builder of the mechanism, 
because of course it will be much more interesting if we have something done by Archimedes' hands. So they will agree. If we have good arguments, they will not have any problem. Right. Okay. John. In Islam, is there tradition because there's better continuity between early Islam and, uh, and the, the, the Greeks? Or is there were there similar mechanisms? Well, uh, as I said, the the first mechanism that we have if that we have is uh, 600 BC. Um, I don't remember. Do you it's remember? Byzantium. It's from Byzantium. It's in London. Um, and it's in, in the London Museum of Science. Is that right? Um, but it, it probably goes through um, the Arabic words. Yeah, probably. Because the, they were who tried to improve the, the, the Greek astronomy. The, the Latin world was more waiting new things. Yeah. And may I say? Yes, um, you can. The mechanism here, the astrolab, the geared astrolab in the History of Science Museum here in Oxford, uh, it's Persian from 1221. Uh, but it has only, we counted yesterday, six or seven Six or seven years. years and it's by far more simple than this. Yes. So we, we don't know why the, the tradition uh, was lost. We don't know why it's the, the only one that we have. Um, there is an argument related with the uh, recycling, recycling, mm -hmm. that the, the bronze, it, it was very expensive in those times, particularly in, in the battles, and they, they have to build weapons with bronze, so all the gears became, uh, you say, souls. Um, but this one at the bottom of, fortunately, it was at the bottom of the sea, <laughs> and so it, it was not recycled. Very good. Well, uh, join me in thanking Dr. Carmen very much. <laughs> and um, if I may, just one quick announcement. On Thursday, 9 February, two weeks from today, here at the same place, same time, uh, Dr. Andrew Robinson from Exeter University will be speaking on Fingerprints of the Trinity, the Neglected Doctrine of Vestiges, and the New Science of Science. So hopefully see you all in two weeks' time. Thank you for coming.